I didn't quite finish grading your exams. I'm try it. I got about 75% of the way done. I'll try to finish them today, but I'm not sure if I'm going to finish them today or not. Um, for sure by tomorrow morning. Let's see. I can't call it. I think I can finish them by, by then. Okay. I didn't mean your videos. All right. Uh, today is lecture 11 here. And I want to start lecture 11 with a little story. Story, a bedtime story. A story of a monk on a mountain. Want to come in there? Exactly at sunrise one morning, a Buddhist monk set out to climb a tall mountain. So you need to visualize here as, as we read the story. The narrow path was not more than a foot or two wide, and it wound up around the mountain to a beautiful glittering temple at the mountain peak. The monk climbed the path at varying rates of speed. He stopped many times along the way to rest and to eat the fruit that he carried with him. He reached the temple just at sunset. At the temple, he fasted and meditated for several days, then began his journey back along the same path, starting exactly at sunrise and walking, as before, at variable speeds with many stops along the way. Back down the mountain. Here's the question. Will the monk ever be at the same position on the mountain at the same time of day? The day that he climbed up and the day that he walked up and the day that he walked back down. You think yes or you think no way? Possibly. That's, that's a good answer. Yeah. Hedge your bets. Anybody feel like they know for sure? One way or the other? Okay, I guess it's got to be a possibly or for sure. It can't be a definitely no. I suppose I could ask, do you think it's likely? What's the probability of it? But we have no handle on how to assess probability here. Actually, the answer is yes. There will be a moment where he is exactly at the same spot at the same time. No, because he's starting at the bottom and he's ending at the top. At, starting at sunset, and, and the other way on the other day, at sunset, or su sunrise, uh, the exact same time. Is it possible to prove? Well, yeah, if you want just a purely visual proof. I suppose you can argue this proof is pretty rigorous. Uh, I mean, we emphasize that the path is a foot or two wide, so he can't go back and forth, really. but. So his feet may never be exactly in the same spot at the same time, but essentially at the same spot on the path at the same time. Because you can graph his, um, you might say, distance up the mountain along the path. Maybe I should call it position. Position along the path. So the path winds up the mountain around and around that, but you can still think of a position along the path as a linear quantity, measured in millimeters or feet or whatever you want, along this path. <clears throat> and here's the time, here's sunrise. The first day, when he goes up the mountain, the, the path, the uh, distance, position along the path might look like this. He stops for certain amounts of times before he goes on. Gets to the, oh, they were going too fast, I think. Gets to the top of the mountain. Let's say that's the top. At some point in time. When he goes back down the, the other day, <clears throat> he starts at the top. He's at that position. He goes back down, stops for a while. You can't avoid these graphs crossing, can you? There's nothing you can do if he's going to get back down to position zero. The graphs must cross. Okay, so that's the essence of the fact that there must be at least one moment in time when he's at the same position at the same time of day. What do you need? You need the continuity of these graphs. These graphs are continuous. He's not warping from one spot to the other. 
not warping space. Essentially, it's the intermediate value theorem. Have you heard of that theorem? That allows you to prove based on the continuity of these graphs that they must cross somewhere. And we're going to see the intermediate values theorem statement today. And you're going to have one problem on the next homework assignment where you need to use the intermediate value theorem. In fact, let's go ahead and use it. Talk about it right away. Why wait? It is one of what I call the mega theorems that follow from the definition of continuity and the completeness axiom. <clears throat> what do I mean by mega theorem? I don't mean really, really big in their statements. I mean really important. The IVT, intermediate value theorem, and the EVT, the extreme value theorem. First day of class, we also saw the MVT, MVT, right? Most valuable, mean value theorem. So we've got these three different value theorems. Intermediate value theorem, extreme value theorem, and mean value theorem. We're going to see them in that order. Today we will talk about the intermediate value theorem, in fact, right now. So let me go ahead and state it fully on the board here. We haven't defined continuity yet. So technically speaking, I'm writing this theorem and I'm going to assume the function is continuous, even though we haven't defined continuity yet. The IVT, intermediate value theorem, suppose f is a function whose domain is a closed and bounded inter interval, and whose codomain is the real number system is continuous on the entire closed interval. And suppose V is any number, V for value, any number between F of A and F of B. It's between them, it is an intermediate value. V is the intermediate value we are, often, we are concerned about. Actually, oftentimes V is taken to be zero. Not always, but oftentimes when you use the intermediate value theorem, you, you construct your example in such a way that you can apply it when V is zero. Do you think you can predict the conclusion? Then what? Can, can you predict it based on the monk story, maybe? This is our intermediate value between these two numbers. We're not saying which of those two is bigger or smaller of these two. And if they're equal, I guess V would have to equal what they equal. trivial in that case, but you think you can predict? Anybody got an idea? Anybody read ahead? Section 3.3? No? Let's pretend the function's increasing. Here's f of a, here's f of b, here's v. Now do you think you can predict it? I'll continue giving hints here. <coughs> there oh. is a number in between A and B, which the F of that number is. Yeah. Just like with the monk, there was a time when he was at the exact same spot at the exact same time of day. Here, there must be some number, call it C, so that f of C equals B. There exists a C in the interval from A to B, such that f of C equals B. This may seem like, well, what's the big deal? Is this such an important theorem? I mean, it's pretty obvious, it seems. Well, first of all, proving it is not obvious because it's ultimately going to rely on the completeness axiom. And the definition of continuity, which technically speaking involves the definition of limits. And so 
It's not trivial to prove. Travis, you want to say that? Is it important that that's an open interval, not a closed interval? Or C and A? Uh, C is, uh, in this interval, it could equal A or B. It can. Yeah. I mean, if, if, F, if in the case where F of A equals F of B, you could have a graph like this, and then C would have to be A or B in that case. What makes a theorem important to a mathematician? You remember what I said? You can use it to prove other things. Exactly. If you can use it to prove other theorems, that's a useful theorem. All right? When you can use it to prove other theorems. Do those other theorems, this might seem like it doesn't have much practical real life application. Well, OK, you could apply it to the loan problem. There are actually some unexpected other kinds of applications as well. But other theorems, the mean value theorem, the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, that we're building up toward are definitely useful in practical situations. Okay. So, but to a mathematician, this is really important because it's it's useful in proving lots of other things. What would be a basic application of it? Like the application you're going to see in your homework. Let's plot a fifth degree polynomial here, and I should have done this ahead of time. I kind of like this to have five zeros if I can get it to have five real zeros. Let's see here. I'm not sure if this kind of thing would help be helpful necessarily. I don't know if this is going to have five roots here. So it looks like it only has one. Ah, let's see. Let's, let's make, well, let's make uh, this one negative here. Well, we're getting closer. It looks like we've got three real zeros. There, theoretically, there could be more. There could be up to five real zeros. Maybe I'm not seeing the whole graph, the whole behavior here. Probably it looks like it's just those three. OK, we'll be satisfied with that. Somewhere between negative 1 and negative 2, somewhere between negative 1 and 0, and somewhere between 4 and 5, it looks like, are three real roots. How would you prove there are three real roots? Do you have to find formulas for them? Do you have to find what they are? That's probably a difficult thing to do, because it's a 50 degree equation. If it were quadratic, you could use the quadratic formula. If it were cubic, there's actually a formula for finding solutions of cubics. If it were fourth degree, there's a method for that one too, but fifth degree and higher, there's no general method for finding the roots in terms of square roots and cube roots and fifth roots, <coughs> etc. There's, in general, no special formula. Now, for certain examples, you might be able to find the roots, but in general, if you, have, if you just sort of write down a random fifth degree polynomial like I just did, probably there's no simple formula for the roots. Can Mathematica find them? Uh, perhaps, let me just test it and see, but Mathematica may end up representing them in a strange way, in a way you're not used to if it does. Uh, let's see. I need to I want, excuse me, I want to salt in that time root. Okay, yeah, it's representing them in a strange way. It's sort of saying there are roots, but not telling you what they are. Can you approximate them and solve? That can be approximated, and I do notice that two of those roots are complex. It looks like we do have three real roots. Probably those are just approximations. In all likelihood, those, the real roots are probably irrational numbers. And these are just approximations. These two and then this one. So if you can't find an exact formula for the roots, how do you know they exist? It's kind of like the same issue as proving square root of 2 exists. The best, quickest way to prove that these three real roots exist is to use the intermediate value theorem. You're going to have a problem like this on the next assignment. Um, I don't want us to write too much. Maybe I'll just verbally describe what to do. 
can write something out if you want. I mean, this function, this polynomial, <clears throat> it is a polynomial. Polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. That is a theorem in section 3.2, or main section for today. The intermediate value terms in the next section, you have one problem in the next section, 3.3. So polynomials are continuous everywhere. That's a result you won't have to prove. Okay, it's actually not super hard. You just prove constant functions are continuous. You can prove that the function x, the identity function, is continuous. And you can prove that algebraic combinations of functions that are continuous are continuous, as long as you're not dividing by 0. Arithmetic combinations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And you can use induction. It's, it's not real pleasant to prove, but it's not super hard to prove all polynomials are continuous everywhere. You can note f of negative 2 is negative. You could do that calculation if you're proving this, that there are three real roots here. You would want to do that calculation. Calculate f of negative 2. You get a negative number. Calculate f of 1. Looks like you get a positive number. Yep. By the intermediate value theorem, with v equal to 0, there's got to be some c between negative 2 and negative 1. Where f of c is 0, there's one root. I hope you're paying attention well enough to believe you could easily do the other two in a similar kind of manner. Okay? So once you have the intermediate value theorem, proving that there are three real roots to this function is pretty easy. Proving the IBT is, is harder. Mm -hmm. So is that something where you just have to prove that there exists at least three? Because couldn't you technically have like two? You'd be, three? Yes, you'd be proving that there's at least three. You're right. The mean value theorem in chapter 4 would help us prove that there are exactly three ones we knew there were at least three. But we're not there yet. So yes, you'd be proving that there's at least three roots. You do know there couldn't be more than five, right? you know about that? Does anybody about the, know what the uh, name of that theorem is that says in general for a fifth degree equation like this, there would be exactly five roots in including complex numbers in including uh, counting multiplicities. And you'd have no more than five real roots. What's the, what's the name of that theorem? You should, everybody should know this. Let's talk about that in algebra. Gauss was considered the first person to approve it. It's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fact that every polynomial of degree, of degree n has n complex roots counting multiplicities if you have a double or a triple root. And therefore could not have more than n real roots, for example, or complex roots. Okay, that's something everybody should know. Okay, uh, but where are we? We, we just, the last time we defined the epsilon def, del, delta definition of a limit, Let's do the scratch work for another example. We won't do the proof for sake of time. Using that definition. Now let's see if we can even use it at a general number. I'm going to consider the limit as x approaches c, where c is unspecified. That's what I mean by a general number of a particular function. The function I'm going to pick is, oh, I don't know, 3x minus 4 over 5x plus 2. I guess c better not be negative 2 fifths, right? That would be the one number c better not be, because otherwise you'd be divided by 0. What should the limit of this be? For x approaching other values of c, it sh this is a continuous function, except when x is negative 2 fifths. It should be what you get when you plug c in. It should be 
should be that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be okay for C to be negative two fifths because it's approaching negative two fifths and never actually reaches it? The limit would not exist though. Um, you're going to have a vertical asymptote at negative two fifths. Uh, I'm thinking it looks like probably like that and like this probably. It would have, you could write, can you get, get this over here? The limit, if, I'm, if my graph is correct at least, the limit as x approaches negative two fifths from the right of the plus sign there of this function, you could say that equals quote unquote minus infinity. Infinity and minus infinity are not numbers, but it's unbounded. It's not bounded below the outputs as x approaches negative two fifths from the right, if, if my graph is right here. I think it is. You could write that, but the ordinary kind of limit doesn't exist. Actually, the one-sided limit doesn't exist either. It diverges, but in a special way, and so that we, therefore we write minus infinity there sometimes. So we're trying to see if we can believe that we can prove for an arbitrary c here, not equal to negative two-fifths, that the limit of this function is x approaches c equals the function value at c. So how close should x be to c to make this less than a given epsilon? <coughs> should end up doing the proof because the proof is going to prove something else as well. Not just the existence of this limit. Like we have to do the scratch the first though. Okay, the only thing you can do is go ahead and subtract the fractions. So do it. Get a common denominator of 5x plus 2 times 5c plus 2. I am thinking of C as being a constant, some fixed number. X is the variable. <coughs> Hopefully a bunch of stuff cancels here. 15XC minus 6X minus 20C minus 8 is what I get when I FOIL that. Then minus, use parentheses to be careful here. This times this is 15xc plus 6c minus 20x minus 8. 15xc cancels with the minus 15xc there. Distribute the minus sign through in your mind. The negative 8 plus 8 cancels. The other x's in the c terms do not cancel completely. Oh, let's see what would be the best way to write it. We're, we're trying to, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get something maybe times x minus c up top because we're wondering what happens when x is close to c. Will that happen? Six there and six there. We've got a. Um, do you want to say I something? I think it should be a plus six x. So six Where? Right there. There. Okay, thank you. We've got a six x minus six c. The six can be factored out and be times x minus c. negative 20c there and a plus 20x there ultimately. The 20 could be factored out and b times x minus c. And then the x minus c could be factored out of those two terms. 
this hole in the head. Now I just forgot what I said. Okay, maybe I better be careful here. 6x minus c plus 20x minus c. Actually, you don't have to bother factoring the x minus c. This becomes 26x minus c, right? Let's go ahead and write that down. 26 times x minus c. Does that look good to people? Let me rewrite the order on the bottom. over the absolute of 5c plus 2 is really a constant. Here's the part that involves the x. You can separate it out like that. So this is a constant we don't really have to worry about. The only thing that's kind of troublesome here is dealing with this expression right there. But maybe we could do it without loss of generality. Hmm. And the typical thing we do is we assume x is within one of what c is. However, that's a bit of a problem here because we don't know what c is, and c could be close to negative two fifths, which is kind of a problem. Hmm. I'm not sure what to do offhand, other than to just say let's, let's pretend c is further away from negative two-fifths than one. I'm, I'm not sure the best way to answer this in general. Offhand here. I'd have to think about it more, and for sake of time, I don't want to spend 15 minutes trying to figure it out. Okay, So let's, let's assume the distance between c and negative two fifths is greater than one. And without loss of generality, then, let's assume the distance between x and c is less than one. So this is not an arbitrary c. c, this is negative two fifths, there's three fifths, positive three fifths, and negative seven fifths. I'm pretending C is either over there or over there somewhere, off to infinity. C is fixed, though. I'm thinking if, if I assume those things, and x minus C, x is within one unit of C, even though this could becomes unbounded on the entire real number line, I can, I can bound it on the interval I'm concerned about. where x goes between what would be c minus 1 and c plus 1. This is turning out messier than I was hoping. We're not going to time the whole curve. Um, graph of the absolute value of 5x plus 2 as a function of x would look something like this. It would be 0 when x is negative 2 fifths. I'm assuming x is further away from negative 2 fifths than 1 because I'm assuming c is further away. Actually, sorry about that. Oh x could still be close to negative two fifths. Yeah. Okay, let's pick c to be something specific. I worked this out ahead of time. 
with a specific C, and then I thought, oh, it won't be that much worse with an arbitrary C. But I was wrong. Okay. It's becoming, you know, even if I assume C is further away from negative two fifths than one, then X could be still close to negative two fifths when it's within one, one of C. Really, I want to assume this. But it's just getting too nasty. Okay. So let's just pick something specific for C. Say C equals um, five. Then the scratch work, what I have over here, right there, I'm going to now translate over there and plug in C equals five. 26, the opposite value of 5c plus 2, that would be 27. Absolute value of x minus 5 up there. Still have the absolute value of 5x plus 2 down there. Now without loss of generality, um, x, the distance between x and 5 is less than 1. So x is between 4 and 6. In that situation, the absolute value of f 5x plus 2 equals 5x plus 2 because it will be positive. And it will be greater than uh, what I get when I plug in x equals 4 into here, which will be 22. It's positive. And when I take the reciprocal then, 1 over 5x plus 2, that's still positive, but it's less than 1 22nd. So now I can, if, I'm, if I use my without loss of generality there, I can go ahead and plug that in here and say this is less than 26 over 27 times 22 times the absolute value of x minus 5, which, to keep things simple, is less than the absolute value of x minus 5. So now in my proof, when I let epsilon greater than 0 be given, it'll be good enough to let delta equal epsilon. This will be less than epsilon. I want that. That will be true if delta equals epsilon, and I assume that the distance between x and 5 is less than delta, and also less than 1. So actually my delta will be the minimum of 1 and epsilon. This is not super pleasant, but I think it's worth it to realize that I run into roadblocks too, for one thing, okay? I'm not perfect. And, you know, how do I deal with those roadblocks? Well, in this case, I make it easier on myself. can't always do that. By picking something specific for C, it works out nicer. This again was giving me trouble because, you know, even though C was further away from negative two fifths than one, X itself could still be pretty close to negative two fifths. This one over this could be large, and I was like, ugh, I don't want to have to deal with that. Not that you can always do that, but you come to me for help or send me an email, and I try to help you through it. Your problems are always doable. If I was able to prove that this was true, not only would it prove the limit is true, it would also prove that this function is continuous everywhere except when x is negative two-fifths. Because the definition of continuity this. Suppose i is an interval could be open, could be closed, and c is an element of i, could be an endpoint, doesn't have to be. 
probably should have said the, uh, the other way. It could be in the interior of I, not an endpoint, or it could be an endpoint. We say F is continuous at C. Emphasis on at C. If for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that the distance between f of x and f of c, not l, there is no l here, is less than epsilon for all x in the interval satisfying the condition that the distance between x and c is less than delta. If C is an endpoint, by the way, technically speaking, we're really thinking about a one-sided limit here, but by emphasizing that X is in I, which is the domain, you're sort of taking care of that. And so you don't have to think about one-sided limits versus two-sided limits in this definition. Because I'm, I'm assuming X is in the domain. And so C, even if C is an endpoint, of the interval by saying I'm assuming X is an I, I don't have to worry about points to the left of C. Okay? So you don't have to phrase this in terms of one sided limits. But this is this is of course related to the definition of a limit. What are the differences? For the definition of a limit we had an L. What does it mean for f to have a limit at c equal to l? It means for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta such that this is true where that's an l. For all x in the deleted neighborhood of c that we mentioned last time, satisfying this condition. So this was an l before we were talking about deleted neighborhoods in class, at least in the book. They don't talk about deleted neighborhoods. They also make the assumption that the distance between x and c is greater than zero, so x would not equal to c. This is true if x is c, though that's trivial, because then you get an f of c minus f of c. So I guess I could define this in terms of deleted neighborhoods, since this is trivial when x is at c. But f does need to be defined at c. can't be justified in deleted neighborhood to see. Continuity over an entire interval then just means it's continuous at every point in the interval. That's all. Once you have this definition, you say f is continuous on the entire interval if it's continuous at every point in the interval. In essence, the essence of continuity at a point in one equation, the limit as x approaches c of f of x must equal f of c. We're technically here based on this one equation, if C is an endpoint, like a left hand point of the interval, technically speaking, this would be a right hand limit. I'd have to approach C from the right. And if C were the right hand point, I'd have to approach it from the left. It's taken care of over here because of the I there. X must be an I. That's the essence of continuity in one equation. And there's, as far as, um, this continuity gun get, goes then, there are sort of three ways that a function can fail to be continuous at C. F could fail, okay, there's, let's phrase it this way. This means one, F of C must be defined.
f must be defined at c. I already said that. Two, the limit as x approaches c of the function must exist. And three, they must be equal. I'll just put the equality there. So it's kind of funny. I'm saying this is the essence of continuity in one equation. But I'm saying this means three things, where one of the things is the equation itself. But writing it this way emphasizes ways that functions can fail to be continuous at c. f would fail to be continuous at c, for example, if f of c is not defined. It can't be continuous at x equals c if f is not defined there. It can fail to be continuous at c if the limit doesn't exist. And it could fail to be continuous at C, even if 1 and 2 are satisfied, but 3 is not, if these are not equal. So f of C must be defined. Okay, so again, if you've got a, a hole in the graph like that, or you've got a vertical asymptote, and f of C is not defined, for sure it can't be continuous at C even if it's continuous everywhere else. F of C might be defined, but this limit may not exist. The left and right hand limits might not be equal. That's called jump discontinuity. You could again have a vertical asymptote, even if, even if F is defined at C to be something. Or another way the limit doesn't exist we've seen is the function, for example, could oscillate infinitely often as you approach C with an amplitude that stays constant, essentially, or maybe even increases. We saw that, right, last time. I showed you a picture of that in Mathematica. The limit wouldn't exist there. Where is C here? I, I'm pretending C is somewhere over here where the oscillations you have an infinite number of oscillations as you have upper C. Or again, even if these are true, even if f, is, f of C is defined and the limit is uh, exists, f still may not be discon uh, continuous at C because you could have a hole in the graph and f of C is defined to be something else. That's the kind of graph you'd have if one and two are satisfied, but this is, the equation is not satisfied. So that's kind of a silly discontinuity. Maybe you could even call it a silly discontinuity. Actually, we don't call it silly, we call it removable. You can remove the discontinuity. Just define the function to fill in the hole. That would be true even if the function is undefined. Functions with holes in them may seem like a silly thing to consider as well, but they do come up in calculus. In fact, in a very fundamental way, anytime you do a limit calculation for a derivative, you're dealing with a function whose graph has a hole in it. You might say, wait a minute, I don't remember any functions that we took derivatives of that had holes in them. I'm not talking about the original function itself. I'm talking about something like this. as a function of h. Think of x as fixed. As a function of h, something like this, think of x as fixed, is going to have a hole in it at h equals 0. It's not defined there. But the limit may, may well exist. In fact, for all functions we deal with, typically in calculus, this limit does exist. Another common example pe people consider is this limit. Since I'm bringing the sine function into play and I'm dividing by x, you might think this is some sort of crazy function. It's an interesting function, but it's not super crazy. And this limit actually does exist. Does anybody happen to remember what it equals? It equals 1. If you graph sine of x over x, about like this. 
I'm drawing it real carefully here. It's got the x-axis as a horizontal asymptote, both as x goes to plus infinity and to minus infinity. And technically, it's not defined at zero, but the limit does exist as you approach zero at n equals one. If you have your facts about derivatives, and including the L'Hopital's rule, you can verify that by using L'Hopital's rule. This is called a zero over zero indeterminate form. And you can calculate the limit by taking the derivative of the top and the bottom. And lo and behold, we get a continuous function. When we do that, we get a limit of one. But you'd have to know about derivatives and L'Hopital's rule before you could use that. This is still true even if you don't know about derivatives and L'Hopital's rule. It's, it's, it's a true fact. And it actually can be proved without L'Hopital's rule. But if you did happen to know L'Hopital's rule already and were allowed to use it, then you could do this calculation. As usual, you would hope that nice things would happen. Limits have satisfies the nice arithmetic algebraic properties. The limit of a sum of two functions is the sum of their limits, assuming those individual limits exist. Because of those kinds of properties, and because of the definition of continuity and its relationship to limits, Similar properties hold with regard to continuity. You got two functions f and g that are continuous at c. Their sum will be continuous at c. And if f and g are continuous over the entire interval you're considering, then their sum will be continuous over that entire interval. And their difference and their product and their quotient as long as you don't divide by zero. So proving continuity of the sum of two continuous functions is continuous is actually pretty easy because you just use the corresponding properties for limits. In essence, for sums, this is the fact that you use and if you assume f and g are continuous, you get that if they're continuous at c. And that's the essence of the proof that f plus g would be continuous at c. Composition two functions, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> for the composition of two continuous functions to get a continuous function, it's easiest to prove without an epsilon delta argument. It's easiest to use that fact that I alluded to at the end of class last time that I wrote incorrectly on the board. I did edit the video to include the correction. Let's go back a section here, section 3.1 about limits. It's a theorem. We state it essentially this way. Suppose F is defined on a deleted neighborhood, abbreviate neighborhood, U of X. So really, u is of the, it's a side remark here, that u is of the form, some open interval containing x, take out x, where x is inside that open interval, that neighborhood. That's a neighborhood of x. This is a deleted neighborhood of x, it doesn't contain x. Take x out. Then F has limit L at C if and only if 
for all sequences xn converging, uh, well, let's say, say in u, in u converging to c, and it's the converging to c that I forgot to write down in the word at the end of class last time. The sequence f of x n converges to l. So you got to consider sequences that are in the deleted neighborhood of x of c. Excuse me. Oh, that's that's a mistake, isn't it? Not an x of c. Sorry. Using this theorem to prove the composition of two functions, written f circle g, og, okay, no, it's, it's f circle g, what you say, more typically written in calculus books like this, f of g of x, to prove that that function is continuous at some number c, when f and g are continuous, G has to be continuous at C. F has to be continuous at G of C. It's easiest to definitely use this theorem to prove that. The book proves it in about four sentences using that theorem. Let me try to get across the essence of the idea. You consider a sequence in U converging to C by this theorem and the continuity of G at C. This sequence would converge to G of C, where F is continuous. And because F is continuous at G of C, this would be a sequence that would have to converge to F of G of C. And you're done. Apply the theorem again. That would mean F composed with G is continuous at C. So this theorem relating uh, limits to limits of functions to limits of sequences is pretty important. It's used a lot in the book. And it definitely makes a lot of proofs easier. First one being the continuity of this one. These definitions and are, are and basic kinds of theorems are mostly important as work saving devices. Can you imagine trying to prove this function is continuous using an epsilon delta argument? No. If somebody threatened to kill me if I didn't, could I do it? I don't know. Maybe. But I would be really, really scared that I wouldn't be able to finish it correctly. But to prove it's continuous over the entire real number line using these abstract theorems is actually fairly easy once you've got the abstract theorems. You have to break it down at the most fundamental level. It's the, it's the quotient of two functions. And notice over the real line, you never divide by zero. The numerator and denominator would have to be shown to be continuous before you could apply that theorem. Denominator is pretty easy. It's a polynomial. And even with an epsilon delta argument, that wouldn't be too hard to show that x squared plus 1 is continuous everywhere. And it's, again, it's always positive here, never 0. What about the fifth root of that thing? Well, ignore the fifth root for the moment. Focus on the inside. x cubed is continuous. x squared is. Three x's. What about the sine function? You need to be able to prove the sine function is continuous. So you have to have a, that would, theoretically would take a lot of work, because you've got to define the sine function first rigorously without probably without the unit circle, to do it rigorously. So that could be a big pain. But pretending we, we've done that and know the sine function is continuous, this is a composition, sine of 3x. It's going to be continuous. There's a product, x squared times sine of 3x. That's going to be continuous everywhere. There's a sum. 
The only thing left at the end is the fifth root. We will see next time that inverse functions of continuous functions are continuous. The fifth root function is the inverse function of x to the fifth. It's a continuous one-to-one -one function. Its inverse exists and will be continuous everywhere as well. So once you have those things in place, those abstract facts as well as facts about the sine function, for example, Proving this is continuous while tedious is straightforward. And so technically it's easy. Though you have to say things in the right order, that would be the trickiest part of it. Okay, we're about done today. Um, oh, one of your problems for Wednesday does give people a lot of trouble. I'm going to send you a hint about it. Maybe. Um, the other ones aren't too bad. One of them is proving x squared is continuous with that definition that I raised. That's a little tricky as well. It's easier than the, the thing I, I attempted though. Do it without loss of generality. Assume x is within one unit of c when you do your scratch work. Prove x squared is continuous at c. And therefore, since c is arbitrary, it's continuous everywhere. Okay, let's see